pleased to introduce our next speaker, who is Susan Bewley, um, with her talk, Domestic and Sexual Violence, All You Need to Know to Get Started. Susan is an obstetrician specialising in severe maternal morbidity and violence in pregnancy, and has written extensively on these topics, including the book we will be using today, The ABC of Sexual and Domestic Violence. She has served on many Royal College of Obstetrician and Gynaecologists committees and has been a member and chair of several NICE committees as well. She has been a trustee of the Sophia Forum, continues as a trustee of Maternity Action and presently chairs Health Watch UK. Sue has also got a Master's in Medical Law and Ethics and worked as a Sexual Offences Examiner and Research Lead at the Havens, London Sexual Assault Referral Centres. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's um, delightful to be here. If that could be made full screen, that would be fantastic. If not, never mind. Um, I am, in fact, now retired, but still associated with King's College London, having been a consultant for many years at Guy's and St Thomas's. Um, and the reason I've got a slight difference in the title here is that uh, I was very um, privileged to be approached and by someone who set up the Haven Sexual Assault Centres to write or rather we edited uh, the um, ABC of Domestic and Sexual Violence. With our 60 plus years of working in the fields, um, thinking actually this, we wanted to write the book that we wish we'd had when we were medical students back in the 1970s. So I am retired now, have spent 40 years in medicine um, and my views are colored by uh, the time and era I grew up in, the all the women, what I learned from them and the research I was doing. Um, but before anything else, if we have the next slide, I think what it's always very important to do, again, a lesson I learned rather painfully, is you must always know who's speaking to you and follow the money, who's paying them. So could I have the next slide? Yes. Sorry, it should okay. be on. If it doesn't matter, I'll try and just read the tiny, tiny, tiny writing. Here um, we go. Yeah, I've got it. Is Lovely. it on now? So, yes. So I will own up. Uh, I will earn some tiny, in the order of pence, royalties if people buy the book. I'm not doing this to sell the book. I'm doing it because I'm passionate about the subject. But never, never discount that people have biases. Um, I work with a lot of people whose names you may recognise at the bottom here, actually calling for the GMC to register everybody who pays doctors so that patients can know and so if you want to see everyone who pays me for every lecture every sandwich hotel travel expenses not very many people these days but it has been in the past you can see that and when you qualify or if you are qualified um, I would I think it's a very um, a very good thing to be open and transparent something that gives us trust as a profession so I may have some intellectual biases they will do be due to the years I was working clinically. Um, if you look me up on PubMed or any of the books, you will find that I have a lot of opinions. Uh, I like to think they're based on evidence and uh, clinical experience. Uh, nowadays, I'm a trustee of the major charity that supports um, pregnant women and newborn mothers and gets 600,000 downloads for all their advice about Working, uh, working rights and uh, other rights for pregnant women. It's a fantastic charity. I would very much encourage you to go to it, given that one in nine women still lose their jobs when they're pregnant and this affects people, whatever class. Uh, I think every, every woman who's thinking of uh, having children needs to know what her rights are. Um, and Health Watch UK is not a government one. It's a charity that's been going for 30 years that deals with misleading health claims and um, science and integrity in medicine so it's it's the sort of holy grail of evidence-based medicine and concerns about um, some of the efficacy or not of things doctors do or complementary therapists do okay so that's just so you know where I come from who who hasn't paid me mostly the NHS in the past and um, yeah, some of my biases I'm perfectly happy to share with you if we have the next slide um, what I think I was what I think is on it, is uh, two things. One, I just want to tell you that I'm a nice groupie. I've chaired uh, committees and sat on them. Um, I've chaired the Intrapartum Committee, 
and a fertility evidence update. I've done some little ones on uh, non-obstetric and gynecological subjects. And I was also on the public health guideline on domestic violence. So uh, I think it's a fantastic organization. It really believes in multidisciplinarity, including lay uh, perspectives and the best evidence possible. Uh, and you'll see again that issue about conflict of interest, but uh, very trustworthy uh, data, a fantastic stakeholder involvement before the questions are even asked and at the recommendation stage. So, um, yeah, as I say, always keep calm and ask for evidence. That's a wonderful postcard that came out from my dear colleague, Margaret McCartney, a general practitioner who used to write in the MJ regularly and has written several books on, you know, problems in medicine um, to do with the paradoxes uh, in the modern era and well, as well as the human kindness that's very important and gets lost in uh, bureaucracy and managerialism. Okay, I think that's probably all I wanted in the background. Is the next slide the blank one? Yeah, the, the next slide okay. is the blank so, one. Yeah. So, um, you know, I can talk for England or Britain or the world, but you may want to ask me some questions or do you want me to talk a little bit about the genesis of the book? Um, yeah, do you want to talk a bit about the book first and then as more questions, we've got a lot of questions already, so as more come in and we can kind of... Yeah, okay, so some of my views about... Um, women's rights and the abuse and violence that women uh, experience uh, were forged as a student. Um, back in the 70s, rape and marriage was still legal. We were um, fighting about that. I would have gone on Reclaim the Night Marches when a uh, police officer told uh, women to stay at home because of uh, the Yorkshire Ripper and other uh, you know, serious predatory criminals. Um, and women said that's unacceptable. Um, what else was going on in those days? Uh, the Abortion Act, uh, had only just passed in uh, 67 um, and there were multiple attacks on that uh, so so I was it, it was an era it was the era of second wave feminism and that was uh, an issue those were issues that colored my um, partly my desire to go into obstetrics and gynecology that um, there is a contribution medicine makes to inequalities and justice and that was an area I could do something. It was also, I found it, some I started failing exams, which you sometimes do. And, um, and I realized that I didn't really like all the complexity. I couldn't understand all the pharmacology. And I actually used to feel a bit faint after operations lasting more than an hour. So Oxen Gynie had that perfect mix of medicine, surgery, politics, ethics, and, um, and you know, great outcomes most of the time. Um, but of course, what I discovered is that as I got more and more senior, it did get more complicated. Um, I was looking after higher and higher risk patients and I ended up being the first woman to specialize in the subspecialty of maternal fetal medicine. So I did a lot more training later on fetal um, pathologies and invasive procedures and pregnancy as well as the, the women. So I um, did a degree in law and ethics on the way when I got a bit exhausted and looked a lot around the law and pregnancy. And then I happened to sit beside somebody at dinner once who was a forensic psychiatrist. And it turns out, sometimes these things are fortuitous, that you know, we had a common interest in uh, violence in pregnancy. And I'd been as a junior doctor, occasionally told things to our patients and I didn't quite know what to do. And I, I had a mirror. So I sometimes showed people very shockingly their, their vulvas that they'd never dared look at. I, um, I had a card, to, to, so I had um, a hotline for uh, the, the early rape crisis and um, domestic violence helplines locally, but it was, it was just like, oh, I don't quite know what to do. Um, and we ended up doing the first piece of research on violence and pregnancy in the UK, a big study, which actually was fascinating because it partly collapsed because midwives found it very difficult to ask the questions. And they were, they were trained to ask questions. They had a little piece of paper to remind them. They were supposed to do it at the beginning, middle, and after, at the end of pregnancy, but they just stopped doing it. And we found that some midwives got a lot of um, disclosures of violence and some midwives got none. And so actually what was very interesting is not only that we found that there was a significant rate of violence and abuse in pregnancy, but that it was really hard to deal with. And so from that, we set up some services which dealt with this conundrum, um, which is that 
quite often midwives suspect something, don't know quite how to handle it, or they've they're not they've got a relationship, so they might meet the woman again. They'll ask the question and get a no, but not believe it. Or they'll ask the question and then what do they do? And we realized it was very important to separate the trusting uh, relationship with a healthcare professional who has certain statutory duties and the professional sector, which is in fact out in the community in the voluntary sector uh, with the advocacy organizations. So we set up a service where there was a specialist midwife so the midwives could talk to them and specialists advocates um, and the advocates would take pass on the referrals uh, and then they would work with women through the pregnancy to see if they could help them become safer and that made it safe for the midwives who were very frightened of opening a pandora's box that they didn't know where it would stop or what to do and i think for women themselves who are terrified of being labeled mentally ill having their children taken away that separation was very important and we did another piece of research showing how how it worked um, and that is in fact the model that NICE now recommends that there are pathways to community-based organizations so that there's someone on the woman's side because of course a baby once it appears will have the social worker or the pediatrician or whatever if that child's in danger for whatever reason there's a there's a set of people who look after them but that who's on the woman's side and that's the advocate and that advocate might be someone who has to help with housing problems immigration problems recourse to public funds um uh making pla safety plans working out if people want injunctions or whatever but nobody ever tells women what to do because they are so reduced in self-esteem and power that to, to, to build up confidence um, is it, very hard and it's a slow process that requires you know, time and expertise. So that then led uh, to the, um, uh, this book, which was the first book that came out from the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, I'm very proud of. They put a working group to get a multi working group together. And we did a really, uh, this book is, still very good even though it's very old looking at the criminal the police the legal the midwifery the voluntary sector you know women's rights um and then after that i realized that um that we needed something threading through the curriculum from undergraduate to postgraduate and that's why we um uh, jan welsh who set up the london sexual assault referral centers and myself edited this one which you you know you can use it um and go back to i mean i hope it's useful i i want lots if there is feedback please write to me at king's afterwards what's missing i'm i've got to sell enough that they then want to do a second edition but i i'm very unsatisfied with it i want it to be better and and reused so any any feedback good bad or indifferent or what what could improve another edition greatly welcomed well i can highly recommend the book i read it and it really goes through I don't know, kind of the theoretical and the practical elements of treating survivors of domestic and sexual violence, which is so useful because I think without knowing some of the theory behind these things, it's really difficult to understand why we do what we do. Um, so would you like any questions? Uh, delighted to um, answer questions. If I don't know, I will have to go and look them up, won't I? And then come back to you afterwards. I, I can't promise I will be able to. Okay, well, um, so the most voted one is, um, do you have any advice on how to take a history from domestic violence or sexual violence survivors without unnecessarily triggering or traumatizing them, if this can be avoided at all? Um, yes, I think it's something that comes with practice. Um, and I think that People who are very ashamed about the situation they're in or very frightened um, won't tell you what they don't want to tell you. So, uh, and that'll be whether, you know, there's there's a sense in the consultation that there's something else going, I'm sorry, the colour keeps going, there's the sun coming out. <laughs> the, um, the, there's, there's a lot of things that you might open up. You never know. So it's always quite frightening taking history, particularly when you're, you're you know, unfamiliar you might get that somebody's been bereaved, that they're an alcoholic, 
that they're worried about someone else with a mental health problem, that they themselves had uh, one of the many adverse childhood experiences, parents in prison, uh, bereavement, violence, sexual abuse, um, whatever. Um, so it's always a bit difficult um, to be in the moment for something that might be the most important person event of that day for that individual and it's just one of many people in the clinic for you so i think you have to um, learn to listen and watch the non-verbal very very closely there are standard ways of asking questions you know like i ask everyone i'm not picking on you because of your demeanor the way you look you know your class your race i'm not picking on you to ask this question so i think that's the first thing um, and just get familiar with it and quite often you say, how's things? And someone says, not too bad. And I always say, not too bad? Does that mean not too good? Um, and so there's a, an interaction sometimes that people give you a little bit. And sometimes people are very worried that you're going to reject them because of all the terrible things they might be about to tell you. They're actually sometimes wanting to protect you. Um, so I think you know, if, if you're aware of that and you're interacting saying, is it okay to ask you these questions? Or do you want to stop now? Or should we follow it up another day or whatever? Then I think you're demonstrating your kindness and tenderness and awareness that this might be upsetting. And I think if you're not an, a trained uh, psychologist or psychiatrist or doctor or GUM doctor or whatever, then probably you shouldn't be at your stage going too far anyway. Um, but I don't think you should be too frightened if you are very respectful and what would you like me to do with this information? What I think sometimes happens to medical students is because they have more time and because they're often not in a rush, they haven't, they don't, haven't learned to interrupt everyone very quickly, they sometimes get told a lot of private things that the, the actual health professionals don't. It's one of the privileges of being a medical student is that you sometimes have more time to get a whole story. Um, and that can be a burden if someone says, don't tell anyone. Because they might, and you, you, have to, you have to be very clear. Well, look, if you, you know, if you tell me something that worries me, I will have to go and discuss that with a supervisor. I could do that anonymously, which you can, if you go away after and think, goodness, you can talk it through. Um, but I think if people say, you know, I think my husband's going to kill me, or, um, I, you know, I'm feeling so frightened, I'm wanting to throw my baby out the window, that sort of thing postnatally. You, you can't sit there and say, oh no, I'll keep your secret. So I think you've got to be prepared for that as well. Is that is that okay to start as an answer? Yeah, no, for sure. And just, I think we get a lot of safeguarding teaching, a lot of like online courses with safeguarding. And I've been in a lot of conversations re like recently where like it's seen as like this kind of like thing that you have to do and it's not interesting and it's not important. But then actually I think, once you actually get in the situations where you need to use it, it's like, oh, I wish the teaching was much better on this. Because otherwise people do find themselves in these situations where they have no idea what to do with the information that they've been given by a patient. Yeah. Um, just yeah. going back to the culture thing, um, someone said that they really enjoyed the culture chapter in your book. Yeah, um, by Mara Lassa, yeah. Of how we make sure to be mindful of a patient's culture whilst not putting them in a box or stereotyping them. Um, well, you, you do that by curiosity, curiosity in your private life, curiosity in the newspapers, curiosity in your reading of novels, curiosity in your reading about different cultures and what that, what people might do or say and asking through curiosity, your teachers, how would this be in a different situation? Um, you know, bereavement rituals we you know if somebody has a miscarriage or a stillbirth we in Obzangani have to really understand uh, who might want to be called the speed that bodies need to be buried what taboos there are on handling tissue or asking about post-mortems and so forth so it's it's never easy um, but I think if you're genuinely curious a you will that will reap its own reward in what you find out. Um, and I think the, at the moment, what we're seeing in this explosion of um, interest, uh, thanks to Black Lives Matter, that 
out there is a lot there are a lot of resources for doctors i think it it will be very specific to the specialties you go into um and of course every every person is an individual and i think you just start with that humanity you shouldn't go too wrong because you might find out that a lot you know 70 percent of people of this characteristic x but 30 percent don't so you, you, you're you never going to have a, an easy checklist that will tell you how someone will react. Um, uh, so, and when it comes to domestic sexual violence, of course, it's very, it's, it's very complicated by uh, social norms, which are, you know, families have social norms. You know, in my family, this is the joke we have. In my family, these are the values we have. Um, let alone groups of people or communities of people, um, let alone societies. You know, that wonderful new book by Jessica Taylor called Why Are Women to Blame for Everything? The way we blame ourselves and other people blame us. So um, social norms are incredibly powerful um, and it's very individual. But, you know, we, we, we recognise that some of these things are crimes at the most extreme and just insults uh, at the less extreme but these have impacts on health and that's where doctors come in and have to ha have to have an understanding of culture and they have to have an understanding that this is a crime that belongs in the social sphere and the criminal justice sphere but it has impacts on mental health and physical health and that's where we can come in and a help the individual b witness it witness it literally by taking the history, writing it down, and be bear witness with someone, you know, what happened to you was wrong, you know, um, and we collect data which we then can feed back into society about the terrible impacts on health. Um, so I think that's how I think about um, you know, to culture, what extent culture does... meets me and in my role as doctor. To what extent does research kind of influence the law and policing like is it done through like parliamentary working groups like what's that have you felt like you've influenced the law with your work um how um, does that kind of uh I, I wish but um so uh i'm not a lawyer and i'm not a politician so i i can't i mean i wish i wish i knew how things changed you know i've witnessed spasms you know, the advantage of being very old is that you start seeing the patterns that you didn't, un I didn't understand when I was young. I'm, I'm not sure I even understand them now, but there are definite moments where doors are firmly shut or opened. Um, and there are definitely good arguments to be made um, and data will support arguments or undermine arguments and everyone argues about the data. Um, but research is very very powerful uh, it can be very powerful it also has its own distortions because who funds what research who gets to ask the questions who gets to answer the questions and i've moved from very big data right at the beginning of my career i did a massive study looking at blood flow into the uterus to predict complications of pregnancy so it was uh, so epidemiology and very biological and gradually well i've covered i'm, I'm a bit of a dilettante i'm not haven't got didn't have a research empire or anything so um but i've done mo used most of the methodologies but i've also now got involved with a wonderful group if anyone wants to look it up online something called survivors voices um and this is one of the very few well it's there's a lot there's a number but it's one of the charities that actually is trying to represent adult survivors of child abuse they don't define any particular abuse you're not got a better category or worse category or we're not even competitive about it. Um, and they've produced a wonderful charter um, which says that whatever we do, it should look the opposite of abuse. Abuse is denial and silencing, so we should be giving voice. It's uh, power relations, so we should be trying to make equitable ones. And then from that, they've also produced a very interesting research ladder saying, actually, going off and making your research career, writing papers, getting money by interrogating uh, a marginalized group of one sort or another and extracting information from them information is also power and you're using them as a means to your ends 
So they've talked a lot about how you get survivors of abuse and violence right at the beginning, asking, telling you what the questions that matter are, involving them maybe by training and employing them as researchers. And they're, they're really interested in the impact. They're not interested in the paper. They're interested in how does the paper affect the policy? How did the paper affect a change in police attitudes or medical attitudes or services? So um, I'm not quite sure what the question was, but it drifted into that answer. It's more of a prompt. <laughs> Um, there's another question here. Um, what do you think has been the most positive change, if any, to happen with regards to sexual sexual violence in medicine in your career? Or the treatment of sexual violence in medicine in your career? Yeah, you've used that word treatment twice. I, treatment, um, sorry. I, no, 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 no. It's, I'm delighted you did because it gives me a chance to get into a particular point, which is that uh, it's really important not to medicalise these issues. Um, we use the language of diagnosis, treatment, out, you know, various bits of language. And because, you know, we like to fix problems. We're problem solvers and we like to fix them. And actually, sometimes what we do is just listen. And that is helpful. Never, even doing, doing nothing skillfully can be very uh, important. Uh, it can make people feel validated and heard. And, um, and we take the burden off. We can't take it all home with us. We, we share it. Labeling is what we do when we make a diagnosis is give a label. A label can be incredibly helpful and it can destroy a person's life. Um, uh, a treatment mean you know, when people reject our treatments, uh, we get very cross with them. They take themselves, they don't tell their clinics, they discharge themselves against advice. And, you know, and we don't understand why they don't comply or concord with our advice or our pills or our surgeries and it took me a long time I was you know well into whatever SPR level it is nowadays um, you know realizing that when a woman with severe preeclampsia and a blood pressure that could cause a stroke and three plus the proteinuria was discharging herself against my extremely caring good advice that she might have a fit or stroke or die you know she wasn't being difficult she actually was more concerned about the safety of her two children with her husband at home. And, you know, starting to realize that, that, you know, what is annoying to me because I'm not doing my job properly isn't the issue. It's her understanding and her safety or her children's safety. So, um, sorry, I again lost the thread. It was, you then asked, what's the best thing I've seen? So the two best things I think I've seen, um, uh, in my mother's generation, I think the best thing was the provision of safe abortion. Um, I think there's only two types of abortion, safe and unsafe. Uh, and, you know, legally having legal abortion and decriminalizing abortion is a way to make it safe. And in my lifetime in, uh, in Romania, Ceausescu banned abortion and then it came back again. And we just saw maternal mortality go up and down. One third of maternal mortality is prevented with legal abortion. So that was my mother's generation. Um, to do with sexual violence, um, I think that I remember watching a movie along with a lot of other people by Roger Grafe in the 1980s, where he uh, they had a fly on a wall camera with police officers um, and very brutal police surgeons, doctors, interrogating a woman about what she was wearing, what she'd done to cause herself to be raped. And it was so shocking. It was one of those shocking moments for the, the nation. And out of it, a lot of feminist doctors started realizing that they had to offer women, women surgeon approaches with which could concern themselves with the whole health care, not just the collection of evidence for the police. Um, and so a lot of women were setting up the sex assault referral centers in the 1990s and the early 2000s. And I remember going along to Scotland Yard to try and get trained um, as a junior doctor in the 1980s and realizing that I actually couldn't cope. Uh, I didn't like the pathologist gloating over the pictures of dead rape women. Uh, and if I, sorry, I ought to have started the whole thing by saying, if anyone is upset or concerned or gets distressed during this talk, email if you need have to. Have a list of resources on the page. Because yeah, I realise that sometimes, sometimes what happens when I'm talking to students, I get very excited and interested. But actually people suddenly have a thought 
about something that's happened to them or a friend or whatever. Um, and I can't read anybody's faces like I can in a tutorial. So um, we do have a list of resources on our event page if anyone at any point feels like they need someone to speak to. And you're also more than welcome to contact us on the contact details that we left there as well. OK, so sorry, sorry about not mentioning that at the beginning, but and I'm just you know, I, I'm re remembering how um, I'm remembering how traumatized I wasn't traumatized, but how distressed I was. And I knew I couldn't do it. Mm. And I sort of felt, oh, I'm letting womankind down or whatever, you know, my, my own neurosis, don't worry about it. But but I watched the development of the sexual assault referral centers and a gradual specialization within the police so that most, not all of the police officers who are there have moved from just the domestic, what did she do to ask for it, uh, to listen and corroborate. You can't believe everyone, but the rate of false allegations is no different from any other crime. Um, and some fabulous police officers uh, I work with in the latter part of my career who are trying to do what they can, but mostly the sexual assault referral seconds are just picking up a tiny fraction of the immediate assaults, uh, a lot more, um, well, they, they pick up some of the children and the men, and I've seen all sorts there. They actually do very little, and it's half policing, half healthcare. The real advocates for sexual violence are the rape crisis centres, and they see it as political, they see it as catharsis, they see that many of the a proportion of women who come through become volunteers and fight against sexual violence. Um, so that whole movement uh, from the early refugees, the early rape crisis centers, centers, and then the medical part, which is the sexual assault referral centers, I think was very important. We've got more awareness. We haven't eradicated the problem of sexual violence. Um, so that I think is the, 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 the major thing. And then clearly the Me Too movement, I was, very shocked having a teenager growing up in the 2010s to discover that young people's lives, young women's lives in particular, um, and teenage girls going through puberty, what they were being exposed to, for many of us who, you know, used our experiences, went to conscious raising groups in the 1970s and got politicized and thought, oh, the world is now a better place. We've been horrified that the gender pay gap is exactly the same. The exposure of young girls to um, sexual predation and pornography is at a very early age is, you know, very shocking to people pre-internet. And so to see the Me Too movement um, bringing this subject up the same way as we first saw in the 1960s, very brave women get up and give rape testimonies um, uh, in the very, very early part of the women's liberation movement. It, it has been, I, you know, very, I'm very pleased to see that, that People are angry and moving and the young generation are, you know, picking up the baton of the, the difficulties in the world that uh, the old generation are leaving for them. Well, um, there's a question here, um, which I think, I mean, I think we know the answer to a bit, but it's a good talking point. Do you think there's a role for combating rape culture at medical schools um, in changing like mindsets about sexual violence for medics? Um, Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that um, there's a number of experiments being done in universities which are showing that, well, the randomized controlled trials um, are not entirely clear, but there's a number of um, places where uh, education um, and training in particularly in bystander actions um, seem to have decreased the rate of uh, rape of students at university from 10% to 5% in some of the American universities. Now, um, so we have to recognize that people leaving home and some of the safeguards and controls that their parents have, you know, there is an era of risk between childhood and adulthood. Risk is an important thing. We have to take risks, whether we cross the road or, you know, fall in love with it or make contracts or marriages, whatever. Um, but young people are very vulnerable when they're first away from home and universities are not good places. And, uh, and a, lot of, a lot of people, if you actually ask the question as you would in a research, have you ever had sex against your will? 
a lot of women will say yes, but it was a date or but I was drunk or but this, but that. And I can't verbalize that's a sex assault, that was rape. Um, because actually then that makes you a victim. Mm. And so I think it's it's changing culture um, and you know, talk you know, the talking about secrets and the most private secrets people have and the taboos they have. Um, it's got to be done very cautiously. So I would like to see what works. I mean, what works to change culture is a very difficult question because mm. it's it's hard to test it. So something happens and something goes in parallel. Well, was was that an association or was that a cause? Of course, um, we must call it out. Um, and, you know, to see some of the TED Talks um, that there are uh, and, you know, a book where... Um, you know, a man who raped a young woman in Iceland met many years later and have gone on a speaking tour around the world um, about his appalling rape and how she hasn't forgiven him. But they're educating people, young men and young women. It's, I mean, it's very interesting. These are interesting times. So I don't know how you should do it. Of course, it must be done. Yeah, I think it's it's also it's interesting in medicine specifically as well because i think you have not that these people don't exist elsewhere they very much do you have quite a high concentration of like quite proud people like especially the girls kind of being i don't know what the right word is but perhaps less forthcoming with um their own experiences and whatnot because they don't want to be seen as weak because they want to kind of uh fill this kind of quite masculine role that they think that they're like maybe not good enough for so I think it's definitely something that should be yeah um, yeah well certainly we saw we saw medical students uh at the havens and uh some of and there are there's a wonderful woman if you want to look her up in um at UCL called Jane Kavanagh J-A-Y-N-E K-A-V-A-N-A-G-H oh that's my name (laughs) well it's uh she's not Molly she's Jane and um, she's um, using, you know, I think a young woman talked to her as a mentor and some of the words and poetry she's used and some of the role play, plays she's designed in teaching, um, I think are very good. And, and, and it's very, very powerful when you hear, you know, that a member of our family, a medical student in the medical family was turned away at an A&E and just said go away here's a card when actually they didn't check that she had injuries because she was bleeding and they didn't give her uh anti-hiv prophylaxis quick enough and actually when you you know bringing it home through teaching um, and being able to empathize rather than just being it could happen to anyone it could happen to me it could happen to my friend my sister it may have done um it it could be my brother who gets accused it could be it, you know and, and there's a lot of um it's, I mean, it, these are not easy. These are not easy topics to deal with. Yeah, of course. And I think teaching often makes it seem like kind of patient us. There is a big line between them. We do not cross that line. And actually, creating that line excludes a whole number of people, including um, many women. Well, that's a difficult question as well because uh, if we were completely boundaryless, that wouldn't work. Um, uh, and the crossing of boundaries is very dangerous in medicine as well. So we. we we need the them and us, but uh, but we also don't need them. Um, there's a question here because you mentioned, well, you used the term against our will and someone said, I found your review against our will, <laughs> of against our will, very moving. Oh. Um, I'm shocked that um, forensic sexual assault services aren't widely available, or at least they weren't when you wrote it. Is this still the case? Um, no, the... the, the, the the, um, every single police force has a um, has a sexual assault referral centre, so they cover the whole country. Um, the provision for children is a little bit more patchy, and um, the twenty uh, four hour availability is sometimes difficult. But the all the police forces are behind this now, and some of them are paid for. I mean, what's interesting there's a there's a very interesting, very large grant going on at the moment to look at the efficacy of sexual assault referral centers there is a question as to whether they traumatize people more because in the shock then there's hours of you know examining and noticing the bruising taking photographs taking swabs 
explaining about how to avoid getting pregnant and getting STIs, all the rest of it. Um, and, you know, some of the rape crisis think that actually it gets in the way because negative swabs get people off. Whereas actually, if you come later and you give your story, you're actually getting a higher rates of uh, prosecution and successful prosecution. So from historical crimes and from people coming a little bit later. So it's a bit complicated. Um, so there is actually some research going into the efficacy and the models are very different. Some of them are privately uh, done through private firms like, I know, Serco and things like that. And some of them are provided by the NHS and some are paid for by the police. Some aren't, some are shared. In London, it's half police and half NHS commissioned. So um, we've got still a slightly patchy model, which is great because it's a natural experiment. We can find out what's better and what's worse and what you know what what works immediately what works from the criminal justice point of view which is what the police are paying for what works from the health point of view short term and long term and certainly in terms of ptsd everyone wants to leap in and talk and do things immediately rather than letting nature settle you know being very careful and cautious of the first month not to intervene with psychological interventions and debriefing that might make things worse and i think you also said something about culture i just want to quickly say about rape culture being very careful about the word myths. There's a fantastic um, book about, um, it's actually really about climate science, but it's about why myths spread. And I think in an era of fake news, understanding the science of fake is very important. And if you say, oh, it's a myth that rapists pick on women, it, you know, it's the short skirt you wore. Um, actually what happens is that people, you know, yes, they learn it and immediately afterwards they'll say, these are the facts. A week later, they believe the myth more. And so there's actually a science to changing people's minds. And it means never talk about myths. <laughs> it says talk about facts, talk about facts in the positive. And if you're, if you're challenging a myth, take the myth, take it away, but explain why it's a myth. They say that because they're paid to. They say that because the actual fact is so you fill in the hole where the myth was so it doesn't actually become stronger so some of our conversations uh, in person or on twitter or whatever ask for the evidence ask the evidence ask the evidence but be very careful about how you talk to people because what changes my mind is someone like me changing it so republicans need to argue with republicans lib mm. dems need to argue with lib dems yeah. um, and I, because if you fight you end up more strongly in your viewpoint mm -hmm. uh, whereas if someone like me tells me something i'm take it on board and i'll digest it for a bit <laughs> well just to, as a last question because we're running out of time um a topical question for the moment um how well do you think domestic abuse services are coping with the large rise in domestic abuse during covid times uh, well i think uh, i don't know is the answer because i'm not directly in touch um, but I do know that it's a service that goes hand to mouth year on year on year on year it never has enough uh, the charity sector when it's frontline you often hear uh, you know, only one in six phone calls gets answered um, uh, the refuges are full I see some emails about refuge places coming up and there's much fewer of those at the moment at least it's being spoken about as a topic um, but undoubtedly people are overwhelmed as always if not more so because it almost seems as if an emergency people revert to type um, and um, you have to I mean it's awful but because things are uncertain there are also new opportunities there are new opportunities to um, offer services in different ways and to bring things up the timetable and clearly with the domestic abuse bill going through parliament with a lot of support there's there's opportunities to strengthen things and then put the funding in behind it um so i, I think it's you know it's probably a bit too early to tell in two years time whether there was a, a bad blip more murders more um women trapped more mental health problems in the children more uh, you know certainly for the children what's going on behind closed doors in with no teachers seeing them um, no child minders mm -hmm. um, you know I think we we should all be very worried and this sector has not been funded well in the past so we must continue fighting for it 
Okay, well, I think that's all that we have time for. I'll put up your um, final slide. Thank you very, very much. That was um, very, very interesting. Um, and I'm sure everyone else found it really. Oh, I can never get it to go full. Okay, so the last slide here is to, is to thank you for listening to listening to me talk about my favorite subject it's so lovely um but the book is there with the tiny royalties but also please if you think there's things missing or you, you know contact me tell me i you know i will we have some students and young doctor collaborators who are writing the chapters so who knows there may be even opportunities so that's my official work address although i'm a retired professor the um health watch is the charity i chair which you know we we are building a student cadre and um, students uh, who are interested in, uh, particularly in, in the, the non-curriculum stuff to do with transparency, corruption, complementary medicines, things like that, uh, might be interested. And there's my, you know, the badges, I love evidence. We, um, that's just, you know, that's the, that's the scientist in me, you know, <laughs> the, the, the concrete thinking, uh, person who just you know adores adores science but also applying it to this really complex messy uh, world we live in okay well thank you very very much susan um i think it's time